Welcome to the Organ Podcast from the Royal College of Organists with me, Mark O'Brien. Coming up in this episode, I talk to Martin Baker about his life since leaving Westminster Cathedral and stumble across not one, but two undiscovered manuscripts by Sir Edward Bairstow. But first... One of the things I hope we can do regularly in this podcast series is to visit not just historic organs, but rare or hidden organs that we don't often get to see because they might be in a private collection or in a museum, or in this case, in a castle, because I'm about to go into what is one of the largest private chapels in Europe. I'm at Auckland Castle near Durham, which for over 800 years was home to the bishops of Durham. Now, the last bishop of Durham moved out of here in 2012, and this whole estate is now open to the public. But inside is a very fine Father Smith organ that was built for the chapel here in 1688. It's still in use today, and remarkably, the original pipework is largely intact. So to help me explore the colours of this organ and to explain how it fits into the history of English organ building, I'm joined by Professor Magnus Williamson, Professor of Early Music at Newcastle University. Well, Magnus, what a glorious space for an organ, isn't it? Yes, it has a fantastic acoustic, lovely, light, airy aisles on both sides, painted roof, The main chapel is uh, medieval, but there's a lot of 17th century work, and this includes, of course, the organ. Which is over the the west door, up in a a gallery, sort of stuck to the wall, isn't it? Yes, it projects from the wall, and looking up here, we see the date 1688, and on top of the gallery, this projecting two-towered instrument, richly carved and richly painted. And as far as we know, it's always stood more or less in this location, um, since it was installed in 1688. And that's rare for organs of this period, is that usually they've been moved around or the case is somewhere else? Typically in churches and some cathedrals and organs have either been restored to death or it's been moved around the building according to kind of liturgiological tastes, typically in the 19th century. But this is more or less um, where it was when installed. Uh, It was restored, as we can see from an inscription on the gallery, in 1903. And we know from records it was restored by the Durham Company of Arthur Harrison. But it was very carefully and conservatively restored. But we mentioned the date, well, you mentioned the date of 1688. Now, that's exciting in its own right for the history of this instrument. But I suppose really the date that we have to be grateful for in many ways of the existence of this instrument and many like it is 28 years earlier in 1660. Absolutely, because in 1660 uh, the First English Republic collapses and King Charles II is welcomed back and uh, the Church of England is re-established, the episcopacy, the bishops are brought back. There's a huge job of reconstruction And that includes re-employing organ builders who had either had to diversify or emigrate during the Commonwealth. And there's a large amount of work that goes on to restore cathedrals like Durham, a few miles down the road, and to rebuild Episcopal palaces like this one, which had been bought by a parliamentarian and converted to private use. So we're talking the impact of the Civil War, the Puritan movement of Oliver Cromwell in that Commonwealth period. So really, when when Smith comes along in that post-1660 period, there's really nothing available, is there? Many, many organs have been destroyed, or more typically, in many cases, left to go into disrepair um, because there was no need to use them during the 1650s. Uh, Organ playing was abolished in church. The old Book of Common Prayer liturgy, which had been going since 1549, that was abolished. So opportunities to use organs in churches just disappeared at a stroke. Nothing. To nothing. I mean, is it fair to say we don't have any surviving organs, and by that I mean workable, that you have pipes that you can still play, anything in this country prior to 1660? 
There are no um, church organs which survive in a playable condition. We have bits of archaeology from Northamptonshire and from East Anglia. We have a fantastic case at Radna in Wales, but not a complete instrument. So we're really lucky, actually, that here in this chapel, we've got such a, a well-preserved example. Yes, uh, from 1688, and it was periodically repaired, um, but then it fell into disuse, all importantly, in the 19th century, when many organs came a cropper at the hands of restorers, and this one didn't because it was neglected. Well, should we go up and, um, and, and see what it sounds like? And, and hopefully you'll be able to tell us if you recognise what would be a quintessential English sound of organs being built in this period. Yes, and the English sound is something which proved to be very long-lasting and was taken up by foreign immigrants like Bernard Schmidt or Bernard Smith, who came to England in 1667 and becomes the leading organ builder in England. He does work at Westminster Abbey, he does work lots of work at London churches, especially after the Great Fire of London. He builds organs in cathedrals, he is very well connected at court. So Bernard Smith is the builder of choice. He brings you know, the most outstanding craftsmanship to the task of organ building. Well, let's go up. They've got a very precarious spiral staircase after you. We want to go up to the gallery. Did you know about this organ before coming here today? Yes, but uh, for many years, of course, it was in the private residence of the bishops of Durham. So in many ways, the fact that it is slightly hidden away for three centuries and more explains its survival. Yeah. Because no one was there to restore it. Which is a good thing. Yeah. And now we're at the console. It's, it's pretty cramped. Uh, I, actually, I don't know if there's room for both of you. Go in. But the thing that strikes me, looking at this right now, and we haven't really opened it up or switched it on yet, but you can clearly see what is uh, Father Smith and what has been a, a subsequent rebuild. This looks like it's been done very cleverly. We've got the reversed key colours for the grate, which I assume is the Smith keyboard, and then a modern white notes and black notes swell, which is the Harrison edition. But on the right-hand side, I presume these are the old Smith ebony stop knobs. Yes, this is really encouraging because it suggests that Arthur Harrison, who added the swell in 1903, was really careful and enthusiastic about keeping as much as he could of the original instrument. Well, let's switch it on. I mean, instantly I can tell what they wouldn't have had in uh, 1680 is this 13-ounce socket with blower written on it. If you want to go yes, switch, um, switch that on. Yes, well, there would have been a handle, of course. Yes. You know, um, light. So that and that one. Lower. Reading light. There we go. That sounds like it's come to action. Uh, Just open the case. 1903, I think, this, uh, the doors which protect the keyboards. Oops. <laughs> oh, hey. There we go. There we go. Is there a signature Father Smith sound that you're expecting to hear now before you play a chord? Well, hmm. if we went inside the organ, I'd be looking to see whether there's been physical changes made to the pipes. Mm. You know, have the mouth been widened? Have have they been cut up to uh, affect the sound? What is the scaling of the pipe? You know, I'd expect the pipes to be relatively narrow scale um, earlier on. So let's hear it, shall we? Go on. Very gentle, very lightly winded, slightly slow in speech. Um, it certainly affects the way that you play it. And actually, what have we got here? The five stops of Smith. We've got your open diapason, yes. stop diapason. That we would. Um, it is wood. So these, well, the both the stopped diapason and the open diapason are wooden. Ah, right. Principal metal. Principal metal. And then we've got a 15th. 15th, and between those, uh, a, a 12th. Now, 12th, a mutation. Would that be advanced at this stage? Is that already old-fashioned at this stage? How does that fit in with the early evolution of English organ building? 
You see them coming in before the Commonwealth so organs built under Charles I before 1649, you see mutations being used. You don't see reeds yet, right. um, reeds like trumpets and so on. So this specification that we have here, it would be at home in an English organ before the Civil War. But Bernard Smith, who made this organ, grew up in Germany, we know this, and then he probably learned a lot of his trade, his craft, in the Netherlands before coming over here, we, we think, you know, we call him an English organ builder, the father of English organ building in, in many ways. But this is not what was happening on the continent at this time. Why were we not building instruments that they had on the continent? We've still got these small things. So is Smith starting an English sound here, or is he having to follow a memory of the previous English tradition that people are still asking for. He's definitely building within the tradition. Why? Organ building is in some ways a conservative craft because you have complex relationships between the builders and uh, the people commissioning the instruments. Uses of organs uh, remain quite uh, conservative. You know, you, an English organ built in the 1530s would often still be serving the same purpose if it had survived the first years of the Reformation. You know, it could be doing sterling service many decades later. English organs, remarkably, unlike this one, which is clearly based on eight foot pitch, English organs are based on five foot and 10 foot pitch until the 1680s, the decade in which this instrument is built, at which point we move across to eight foot, four foot pitch. But what would these organs be required to do? I mean, what we've heard so far, I can't imagine that leading a congregation. What was the actual role in its liturgical setting? Very good question. And that explains partly why organ building is quite conservative in England. Uh, before the Reformation, going, if we go all the way back to before, let's say, the 1550s... So we're in Henry VIII? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, d during, let's say, during the reign of Henry VIII and before, um, the organ was used in alternation with voices. It didn't need to be a, a large instrument. It just needed to provide a different sound to the plain song or the polyphony that was being sung. And indeed... English organ building culture doesn't favour very large instruments. After the Reformation, you do get the use of organs for complementary purposes, but in the high church environment, which we are in here, they would have been used for accompanying um, relatively small choirs. So we're now talking the music of people perhaps like Gibbons or Bird. Spot that on. Style of Verse anthems yep. uh, out of the deep by Morley or mm -hmm. Teach Me O Lord by Bird, his psalm setting. And we know, for instance, that there was a, a, a choral foundation, a Episcopally funded choral foundation that, that sang here because in 1665, in September 1665, Bishop John Cousin pays for 16 services to be pricked into the songbooks for the college. So this organ was probably used, uh, among other things, to, yeah, to play voluntaries, to play verses after the reading of lessons, probably in a evening prayer, but also to play for verse services and verse anthems. But how was that received by the men and women on the pews? Because we're, we're talking of the Civil War, we're talking of the Commonwealth, this is a Puritan-led movement largely. Was there still a reticence of finding the place of the organ in the church, even when this was being built? Anything which detracted from the word of God was an abomination and before the reformation the organ had not only played in in worship but had actually supplanted voices because like in hymns you would sing verses two four and six but the organ would play verses one three five and seven so it's actually replacing the spoken and sung word and for that reason that the organ is almost abolished in the 1570s it comes within a whisker a few votes in convocation Gosh. of being stopped altogether and after that point it's really there on sufferance and it depends who you are and where you are whether you're able to maintain organs and they are encouraged under James the first um, more so even under Charles the first but then of course as we know they are we cut um, his head off it uh, all goes wrong it didn't quite go to plan 
and so organs are part of the collateral damage and in worship organs were not even as accompanimental instruments were not allowed so really that date we mentioned earlier 1660 the time that the monarchy is restored charles the first's son charles the second comes back to the throne that really is the reason we have pipe organs today if we had remained a republic perhaps and the puritan rule of cromwell had sustained perhaps we really wouldn't have our English church music tradition. And can we go as far as that? We probably can. You know, it's one of a string, a short string of historical turning points which could have turned in the other direction. You know, if, for instance, Edward VI had carried on living in the 1550s instead of dying aged 16, the first Reformation would have seen the end of organ playing and would probably have seen the end of polyphony. We would have had a kind of Cromwellian churchmanship before the letter. If uh, Elizabeth I hadn't been so careful to ensure that there were loopholes in Reformation legislation, the organ may have come to the same end in her day. If there had been a couple of votes changed in convocation in, in the 1570s, the organ would have been abolished. If Richard Cromwell had been more power hungry in the 1650s when he succeeded his father and Charles II hadn't been able to get back onto the throne, the organ would probably have died out as a church instrument permanently in Britain. And that's fascinating. I mean, I didn't realise how, on the knife edge, a musical instrument can be at the whims of well, politics and, and, and religious ideology to that extent. Yes, and partly because it's, a, it's a, an expensive object in a public place and that makes it noticeable and objectionable to some. Well, let's get back to the instrument at hand. So I've always read that the stopped diapason, which we've got here, mm. was something that was a signature stop to Smith. Is that right? Yes, and the, it's very much also an English organ building tradition. So the stopped diapason, or stop diapason as it's called here, wooden flute, is absolutely typical of the instruments of this time. I've never heard this one, so it'll be quite interesting to see what it sounds like. Great. Very reticent. Partly we, we, we don't hear it directly because we're not facing the instrument. What you really notice is the, the gentle voicing and the uh, ability of the stop to carry a polyphonic line. It does. I, I could imagine playing on that for quite a long mm. time and not getting bored with the tonality. That is, it's really lovely, gentle work. Let's have the chorus. Let's, Let's have up. the chorus. So here's with a four foot principal. Now with the two foot. now with the twelfth.
can tell you're really enjoying this. <laughs> well, it's really interesting how the twelfth, given the function of the organ, what it was meant to do, is quite adequate. You know, with a good, well-balanced chorus like this, well-made, n- beautifully voiced, sitting on a generous acoustic. This is a very sweet acoustic. You don't need a thick stop list. Yeah. Well, I'll go down into the nave now Mm. because, of course, we're right on top Mm. of the instrument up here so we can hear this organ in the full acoustics of the chapel. Can you play us something that would have been in vogue at the time that this organ was brand new? Yes, well, the obvious person, well, two obvious people, John Blow and Henry Purcell, and the one I think really would go very nicely on this instrument is Henry Purcell's Voluntary in G. Purcell knew Smith's work intimately and... To a certain extent, when you're playing Purcell's organ music, you know, it was played with Smith's instruments there at his fingertips as he's, as he's writing it. Brilliant. Well, in the meantime, Professor Magnus Williamson, thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you. the previous episode of the organ podcast you may have heard me talking to tom bell whilst he was in the middle of recording messiah at blackburn cathedral well while i was there during that afternoon by complete coincidence this happened so i'm here in the song school at blackburn cathedral with pete asher volunteer archivist from the library in blackburn and the director of music here at the cathedral john robinson pete i was here to do something else bumped into you at the top of the nave after an organ recital you have discovered something quite remarkable, haven't you? Yes, we've been uh, going through some uh, a collection by a, a blind organist from Blackburn called William Wilson Holm. And in the collection, there were some 130 manuscripts of various pieces that Wilson Holm had written. But right in the middle of them, we found two pieces which were not by Wilson Holm, they were by uh, Sir Edward Burstow. And this is in his own handwriting? In his own handwriting. And you've got it with you right now? We have. C- can you show me? Yeah. 
So you, you, where did you find this? Uh, in a cardboard box that hadn't been looked at for probably the best part of a hundred years. And uh, it was just lying there? Just lying there in the library. And do we know, <coughs> have these been published before or did you uncover some works of Bairstow that we weren't aware of? Uh, they've never been published, to the best of our knowledge. We've done a, a very thorough scan of the internet and we can't find them. But we know that his biographer, Francis Jackson, was aware of them, but I don't think he'd ever actually seen them. And we've got them here, you've brought them out. This is on very yellowed manuscript paper, and on the top it says, O come, O come, Emmanuel, him, with original accompaniments by Ed C. Bairstow. And, yeah. and we've validated the signature on it. It's genuinely we, his. It's genuinely his. And inside, this is his notation. He's written the words by hand above the melody. Um, extraordinary find. What did you feel when you, when you discovered this? Did you realise what you'd stumbled upon? Not at first, but I had a word with John Robinson and uh, he pointed out that this was quite a surprise as we thought that all the pieces that best had ever written were in the public domain. Mm. And, and there are two... Clearly, so these two aren't. You've got this uh, Come With Come Emmanuel, and you've got another... Is there another uh, arrangement? It's a setting of the hymn, 40 Days and 40 Nights. Extraordinary. So, John, what did you think when Pete came up and said, listen, I think I found some Bairstow in a box? I was absolutely shocked, honestly, because it's not the kind of composer that you expect to find more works from, because he's so well regarded by British choral enthusiasts that, that the idea we were going to find some actually unpublished completely new pieces by him was not something I had expected at all. And do we know how old he was when he wrote these? I mean are they any good to I me mean, be honest? Yeah they're absolutely marvellous I mean they're really illustrative of the hymn singing tradition that will have been going on particularly in New York Minster as it still still goes on there very very broad tempos but prevalent everywhere else in the country at that time as well and these pieces have got lots of moving parts going on different colours going on of the organ he's left us registrations clearly marked in um, as it gives us a snapshot into how people were singing hymns but also how people were improvising to accompany hymn singing at the time so it's a perfect example of that they're early works they're from the time when he was at Wigan Parish Church but at that time he was also conducting choral societies one in Blackburn and one over in Preston, and it seems like he must have been friends with William Wollstoneholm, and hence the manuscripts either being written for him, perhaps, or at least ending up in his collection. And it's quite marvellous that it's here in Blackburn, because we know, obviously, Bairstow famous when he was at York Minster, but he does have a very solid Blackburn connection, is that right? That's right, with this choral society that he was conducting on one of the nights of the week, I can't remember which, but he, um, he, he was, went on to Leeds, uh, now Leeds Minster, then Leeds Parish Church to be organist there as well, before going on to York Minster finally. They tried to lure him away from there to, to <laughs> Westminster Abbey, apparently, but he said, no way. I didn't really want to leave Yorkshire, did No. Yeah, he no. stuck to his roots. Mm. Well, you're going to perform this at some point in, in March, is that right? That's right. And the Wednesday of Holy Week, the 27th, we're going to be doing it here in a concert in Blackburn Cathedral with the combined forces of Blackburn Chamber Choir and Blackburn Music Society. And we can't... Well, it'd be nice to say it might be a world premiere, but, Pete, do you think this is probably the first performance in living memory, it can be safe in that. Uh, without a doubt. We, we know that these two pieces of uh, manuscript have been in Blackburn Library since the 1930s. William Wilson Holm died in 1931, and we, he was living with his sister at the time, who was his manager, yeah. and uh, we believe she packed everything up and from his study and sent it to Blackburn. Uh, for for us to keep and enjoy. And by a stroke of luck, you found it 90 years later. Yeah, pretty much. In a cardboard box. Well, we can't wait that long for Holy Week, so just for fun, because we're in the song school here at the cathedral, John Hoskin, the cathedral's organist in residence, is here, poised at the piano to give us a, an advanced preview of of the music. John, what is it you can play for us? So I'm going to play the last verse of 40 Days and 40 Nights. I'll play the accompaniment and John Robinson will play the pedal part. Right, well, for the first time, take it away. Thank you. 
Martin Baker is one of our finest organists and choral conductors, having held posts at St Paul's Cathedral, Westminster Abbey, and of course, most famously, as Master of Music at Westminster Cathedral. Well, after 20 years in that role, he surprised many people with a sudden resignation. I met up with Martin to ask him about that decision and to talk to him about his musical background and passion for improvising. So it's perhaps a shock for a lot of people when you suddenly resigned from Westminster Cathedral right at the end of 2019. Was that a difficult decision for you to make? Hmm. Well, I'd done 20 years. I kind of surprised myself by lasting that long. So no, it wasn't a, a difficult decision. I've always had one foot outside in any case because I, I kept my organ recital career going albeit with perhaps not the amount of practice I would like to have had in order to perform at the highest level publicly. But it was a bit of a jump into the unknown, but I quite like those. And and was there a period of adjustment? Because you'd been in that very structured existence. I mean, you'd been there for 20 years. Prior to that, you were at Westminster Abbey and you'd been at St Paul's Cathedral. So a, a routine for you. Was there a feeling of freedom or or of liberty or was there a bit of you know cold turkey you know (laughs) now what do I do a little bit of both I suppose I I I like routine to a point but I always enjoyed the feeling of getting to the end of the Michaelmas term and having 10 days after Christmas or 10 days after Easter and I would hop on a motorbike and head into Europe Christmas, Easter and over the summer. So I I was always kind of itching for that freedom. I mean, when you say that, I mean, you you put your leathers on, get on a bike and head for the Channel Tunnel. They they weren't leathers. It was not that (laughs) kind of bike. (laughs) And I used to like sailing rather than uh, um, going under Mm. the the sea. But um, Easter, I'd usually get a ferry from Portsmouth to Bilbao with leaving at about 10 p.m. on Easter Sunday. So that was a wonderful, kind of almost a retreat after the um, intensity of Holy Week. And then I'd ride down to um, Seville for a few days. But yeah, leaving the cathedral, I had plenty of things lined up, but it was just uh, two or three months before COVID hit. So anything that I had imagined went out of the window. But I quite enjoyed the isolation and downtime that COVID forced on me. Why is that? Are you, are you quite a solitary person? Did you just like the quietness of it? Yeah, I suppose I am quite a, a solitary person and I now live very rurally and I absolutely love that. I've always been a, a city boy, but had this uh, hunch that there was something better beyond that. Um, so it gave me time to sort of relax into that new environment. But I think so much of you is linked with the choir and particularly the sound, the very distinctive sound mm-hmm. of Westminster Cathedral Choir. Is that a part that you miss? I mean, that's a huge music outlet for you. I don't miss it yet. I might do. It took a lot out of me doing that. You know, I think I'm. it's safe to say I'm a more kind of naturally introverted than extrovert person. And uh, making music, say, on the organ is very much something that one does in one's head, whereas choir training is uh, all about being extrovert, and, and, and that is hard. And there was a lot of pressure, I think, in a job like that to continue a great tradition and to continue a great sound. So I'm proud of what I managed to achieve or, or keep going in some shape or form uh, while I was there but I don't think I'm missing it. So was it hard? I mean did you find that difficult then that you had to in a sense step up to perform just to do the choir duties? Uh, Yes I suppose there was an element of that but one just got used to it. You know there were wonderful moments of creating music. Uh, I can't think of anywhere chorally that I would want to make music in more, uh, partly because the choir had such a a distinctive personality. And it was a choir that gave the conductor something to work with, almost too much sometimes. (laughs) But uh, one didn't feel as if one had 
to draw the the music. It was it was there on tap. So. What was that distinctive quality? How would you describe that sound? Because it is world famous. Is it the fact that it's Catholic music, Catholic liturgy? Is it something you were consciously directing them to do? Where where did that come from? I experimented a lot over the time I was there because I didn't know the answer to that question. I'm, I'm still not sure that I do know the answer. At first, I remember thinking, well, the original author of this sound was George Malcolm, who was master of music in the post-war years. And I listened to um, lots of Malcolm's recordings, and there was a wildness about his sound, which I started to try and encourage. And I became aware, I think, in doing that, particularly from recordings, that this wildness was not necessarily something that people wanted to hear. Um, we, we live in a much more kind of manicured age of making choral music. So at some point, I, I began to change the emphasis a little bit more towards blend, richness of sound, really good ensemble. But I think it always sounded like Westminster Cathedral Choir in some shape or form. Partly it's reacting to the liturgy singing mass and vespers to the language, to Latin, um, as opposed to even song and English. That sound you're talking about that comes from, as you were describing, Latin, that rich polyphony that is with, with Catholic music of that style. Is that your natural home? Is that something you grew up with? I'm a cradle Catholic. So in the sense that that sound is innately Roman Catholic, and I think, I think perhaps it is, but I grew up in Manchester. I started playing the organ from a very early age. I think I was four when I first played Away in the Manger. I came home That's and asked... That's very young, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I don't know what made me do it, but there was a keyboard at home and I asked my father to, to teach me. So that's where it started. And I remember when I was five playing some hymns in Salford Cathedral. They were short of an organist on New Year's Day. So, I mean, obviously I couldn't reach the pedals. And who knows what it sounded like. But uh, <laughs> I did accompany the congregation in a few hymns. But there was I'd never heard of Westminster Cathedral Choir, and neither had my parents. So my sense of Roman Catholic music was very different from how it was in SW1. My first formal musical education was at the Royal Northern College of Music Junior School, which was an amazing education. I started there when I was seven, and I had... Uh, fantastic teachers in particular for oral, um, Ida Carroll. She opened my eyes or ears mainly to so many different aspects of music. So I was very fortunate to have that. I started at Cheatham's age 11. Because I was a Catholic, I didn't get into the cathedral for assembly. We, we were given a different kind of, we went to a little prefabricated room and had a specifically a Roman Catholic class. So I didn't get to play the organ in Manchester Cathedral even. And um, you missed all the music of Evensong. You'd never been exposed to that. I didn't get it. No, I, I didn't know what Evensong was. Some friends of mine were choristers in, in, in my year. Well, one or two of them were. And they used to talk about this. And I it sort of went over my head. I thought, what, what, what is this thing uh, of being a chorister? And it was only probably in my sort of mid-teens, perhaps age 14 or something, I happened across Coral Evensong on Radio 3 and became absolutely hooked. And I had no idea that this kind of music was possible. And then when did you make that decision to, that's where I want to be, I want to be making that music? In, in a kind of fantasy way, kind of almost immediately, but I had no way of getting there. I, I was playing at my a local Catholic parish church, when I was 16, I found my way into the local Anglican church. So I got to play, I suppose, more uh, traditional hymns. Uh, I got an all scholarship to Cambridge, to Downing College. It was a kind of um, playground for me then, age 18, to have a choir in an Oxbridge college where I could pretend it was, you know, a much better choir perhaps and, <laughs> and do the kind of repertoire that I might have heard at Westminster Abbey, if I went to Evensong, and, and in those days, Simon Preston was in charge. So it really wasn't until I, when I left university, I got the Organ Scholarship to Westminster Cathedral. By then I was 21. That was my first actual contact with the real 
tradition. I mean, obviously, it's Roman Catholic, but being in an environment where there was a professional choir with daily music. And I mean, so that must have been amazingly lucky for you, because uh, I suppose it's fair to say that Catholic sung liturgy doesn't enjoy the same level of success as perhaps its Anglican cousin. So, I mean, is it really fortunate that you of all people would I say, musically came home by getting that scholarship at the cathedral? Yes, it was very lucky. And I ended up having two years there. But I had to pinch myself when I when I went there that, you know, I'm actually doing this for real. You know, it's been a, it's been a fantasy for a few years and, and now I'm there. So that's part of now what I suppose is a former life of yours. But now you've got more freedom to concentrate on the concert platform. And something that's very close to your heart, clearly, it appears in all of the programmes that you perform, is improvising. Where did that come from? Yes, I do improvise a lot. The first time I realised I could improvise was, uh, I think I was inspired to do it, to to improvise after Mass at uh, Westminster Cathedral when I was organ scholar. I just thought I'd give it a go. But it really goes back to when I was four or five years old and starting to learn the organ of course, I had pieces to practice, but nobody told me I couldn't make my own sounds. So I would, I would just do it. And as I began to grow older, hearing organists that inspired me on, on great organs, I never had organs like that. And I couldn't play repertoire like that. But I used to try and recreate the experience for myself by making my own music and, uh, you know, I suppose living in some sort of fantasy world, really, about what might be possible if, if I had that instrument and were that player. So I, I was never inhibited about making sound. I think that's the really key thing here. That's not the case for a lot of young organists. First of all, they might not learn the organ until they've got to a certain stage on the piano, which I think is a problem. I, I Nobody told me I couldn't learn the organ first, and I then, of course, did learn the piano. And if you start to try to improvise, and you've not been, it's not become something that's natural to do, I think it's very hard. I think people are afraid of touching the keyboard without having some music in, in front of them, and I never had that. So that's that's how it developed, and my first concert performance as, a, as an improviser was in Minneapolis. I was with Westminster Abbey Choir on tour in 1992 and it was being broadcast on NPR and Martin Neary, he was a conductor, said I think you should improvise and we'll give you a theme or the radio will give you a theme and so I did. I think it was pretty terrible actually but people enjoy listening to improvisations because they listen differently I think from how they would listen to a, a written piece they're more forgiving of dissonance, mistakes. They're involved in the, the creative process. And I mean, it's pretty risky, though. I mean, if you're doing it in the middle of a concert, I mean, it's all very well during the, you know, the offertory hymn or something. Mm-hmm. But when you've got a, a concert hall, I mean, you, you use the word inhibition, that you, you, you know, you need to be uninhibited to do that. But you need to be quite brave, I suppose, to stand up there and say, well, listen to this. It could yeah. be better than anything that's been written down, you know, in the last 500 years. Brave or foolhardy, perhaps. <laughs> so, and I, I, you know, in, in a way, you could turn that on its head and say, well, improvising after the Oftery hymn is much harder because the musical theme has all been set up. People have their sensibilities finely tuned to the liturgy. And you've got a difficult task as an organist. You've You've got to be in tune with that and make music that fits in. In a concert, you can do anything you like. It's much easier. But how, how would you describe your style? Uh, changing. Uh, <laughs> I, I think there, there is a style of improvising which would be to recreate other composers' music. In essence, uh, to put it bluntly, to say nothing new. And I kind of have a problem with that. But then at the same time, I don't always say anything new either. But I like the idea that improvisation is creative in the moment, that it's it's the genesis of something, not, not the copying of something. I'm not so interested in the, the contrapuntal, although I have at various stages in my life spent time looking at it because it's a very useful skill. But I think when I am improvising, even if I'm using a particular style, I won't stay in it. So it is quite fun to lure people into a a sense of security in one area of harmony, for instance, and then to kind of crash into it 
and blow it all up. That can make for a very dramatic improvisation, or the opposite, to start with a kind of chaos and gradually to assemble some sort of order. I'm often interested when one does get young people, for instance, to open up a bit at the keyboard. Um, so they might have tried a few formal improvisation exercises. And, and then I'll just say, well, do something that I haven't heard before. Just use the organ. It's like a huge synthesizer. You know, uh, you've got all these white keys that go right the way down and right the way up. How, how often do you play right at the top? They're very, very rarely. And all these black keys, all these pedals, all these stops, which operate at different pitches. And most repertoire is very conventional in what it asks for uh, from an organ. As an improviser, you don't you can ignore all that and just make sound. Do you listen to other organist improvisations? Mm-hmm. Do you think people in this country improvise well? I do, actually, because they have to fit into the the atmosphere of an even song. So if 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 you are the, the maître of a, a great French cathedral, you're 100 feet above everybody. You might not even have to walk into the building to get to the organ. And you have this machine which makes incredible noises. So you can play a, you can play a fistful of notes on a cavalier col, and it sounds electric. If you do that on a Harrison Harrison, it just sounds like wrong notes. And our acoustics here are much drier, so we have none of these gifts uh, that the French organist might have. And yet our British organist can play some very, very convincing pieces before, during, after services. And, and there's definitely a growing interest in the skill over here, but it's a different style from the French. And for those people that find that hard, I would say, well, go go the French route first. Just kind of, you know, let off some steam at the keyboard, relax, make some noise, and then start to refine what you do. You you can't produce something really refined without being unrefined first, and only then can you gradually learn the the real language and be fluent in it in in a natural way. Do you think your improvising, your language, your fluency has changed as a result of leaving that sort of institutional cathedral structure you've done? Have you noticed suddenly, you know, as a door burst open? Hmm. It it certainly changed. I'm, I'm not sure I could attribute it definitely to that change but of course it does mean I uh, when I play music now I'm no longer speaking on behalf of an institution um, even and obviously when one talks one talks on behalf of one's institution if you're employed there but when one plays one does the same really thing, how said. does that work well if you're if you are known as the master of music of Westminster Cathedral in some way that your your playing is going to reflect on that, I mean, are you holding back? I mean, are you, are you talking? You're, you're playing conservatively, or you wouldn't play this <laughs> repertoire? What, how, what does it mean? Well, sometimes I used to push the boundaries a bit. I think uh, perhaps because I was aware that I felt rather kind of walled in by you know, you know slightly straight jacketed, and and that in itself can be fun. But no, I think it's more to do with maturing as a person and uh, finding my own musical language which I'm still in the process of doing that. I mean, in a sense, you're enjoying your freedom. Is it the lifestyle now you've got is freedom, the way you improvise, it's a place of freedom for you? Really, are you having the best time of your life right now? Yes, I think I am. And I'm I'm feeling that it's a, a process of development, which perhaps I, having the, the daily routine, got in the way of that somewhat. Now I'm, I'm free to be more imaginative and, and develop my own ideas. I'm not saying I'll never do anything else again, you know, that, but I also think if I got to the age of when does one retire now, is it 65, 6, 7, or, and, and I haven't done this, and then would be too old perhaps to do a lot of what I'm doing, then I'd have cut out a big part of my uh, musical potential my, and my life's potential. So I'm very glad to have this period. I'm 56 I'm not that young you're not that old no, either. It's, that but it's, it's better than you know being too old yeah. Martin thank you very much <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thank you <laughs>
Well, after our interview, Martin very kindly offered to record a special improvisation for us. But before we hear that, do subscribe to this podcast series to catch the next episode, where I'll be talking to Anne Marsden Thomas and Ghislaine Reese Trapp about their new book of Women Composers for the Organ. I'll be saying goodbye to the organ at Bristol Cathedral as it gets packed up and taken away for a major restoration with Harrison and Harrison. And I talk to Richard Gowers, former organ scholar at King's College, Cambridge, and rising star, not just on the concert platform, but as an accompanist and orchestral player. So until then, goodbye from me, Mark O'Brien, and I'll leave you with Martin Baker's improvisation, which might sound familiar if you're a Mark Knopfler or Dire Straits fan. <laughs>